Welcome to the Michigan Golfer Show. Join us each week as we explore the people, the places, and the events that shape our great game. I'm Bart Lauer with Michigan Golfer. Today we're at the beautiful Timber Ridge Golf Course here in East Lansing, Michigan. And we're going to be talking today about Tom Bendelo, one of the pioneers, really, of golf architecture in the United States and in the golfing world. We're going to be talking with his grandson, Stuart, and he's going to give us some insight onto his grandfather and, and, and the type of things that he did to really kick the golfing world off here in the United States. Stuart, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Now, your grandfather, uh, as we mentioned, is, is really one of the pioneers of golf. Of golf architecture here in the United States. Give us a little bit of background on on how he kind of got here and in, in his family history. All right. Uh, well, he came here in uh, 1892 as uh, a typesetter for the uh, New York Herald newspaper and was working with the Herald, answered an ad for someone to teach uh, the Pratt family on their estate in New York, Long Island to teach them how to play golf. Golf was a new fad coming into the country at that time. The family wanted a course to play for, a private course on their own uh, property. He laid out that course for them and sort of uh, mushroomed from there. He really started out as an instructor teaching people how to play golf, laying out courses for them. And uh, that's how he really got into the game. And then shortly thereafter hooked up with Spalding. And he knew golf from his boyhood in Aberdeen, Scotland, came over and sort of imparted that knowledge to the families and people that he met here. So uh, then as golf really began to blossom and take off in this country, he was sort of on the leading edge of all of that. Now, you had mentioned that he, he did some work with Spalding. What did that involve? I think he got hooked up early with Spalding as uh, I believe he laid out a course for Spalding on his estate in Long Island. And I think that led to an association with Spalding in terms of not only uh, doing coursework, but doing uh, instruction. Because uh, I have some early uh, advertisements that he was uh, running a golf school in New York City in 1895. Uh, Spalding knew that in order to sell balls and clubs, they needed courses. There's some early documentation that there's actually some Tom Bendelow golf clubs out there. How did that kind of come about? Well, that was a little bit later. That was about 1918, 1920. Uh, after Spalding had passed away and Tom had sort of severed his association with the A.J. Spalding Company, uh, Wilson decided they wanted to get into the golfing business, which was booming at that time. And uh, they hired Tom to take over his, the golfing department of the Wilson Company in Chicago. And at the time, they came out with a, with a series or um, a line of clubs with his signature name on them. I, I don't know of many other uh, non-professional golfers that have his sign their signature clubs. But what are some of the some of the bigger ones? Some of the, some of the more nationally recognized golf courses that we might know of. Well, I, the one that uh, probably comes to mind most frequently when talking about him and talking about the coursework that he did, uh, at least the better work, uh, is Medina. Both all three courses at Medina that he laid out. It's difficult to. Uh, you know, to say what his best work because he, he really started from the very beginning when uh, they were courses were no more than a cow pasture. As his career progressed, and particularly after uh, 1920, he was working with the uh, American Park Builders in Chicago, and he had the uh, team behind him. He had engineers and architects and uh, irrigation and, uh, specialists, people who were uh, into the agronomy of uh, the turf and everything else, uh, and he was able to really design some of the more, uh, what would you say, more classic or more uh, difficult courses because his whole thrust really of his uh, interest in the game was to promote it and to get people to play it. I think that's one of the most important things about Tom Bendelow that it, it what, what I've seen in the research is, is that his golf courses were very playable, set up for, for the average golfer and for, for people of uh, average ability to play. He, he put a, a big stamp on the golfing world here in Michigan. Uh, could we talk a little bit about what, what he did here in the, in the state? Uh, I do know that I've been able to identify at least 50 courses that he did here in Michigan. Uh, he was here at the time Willie Park was here. Now that was 1900, 1910, uh, really early on when uh, golf was just getting started. There are a number of things that, that I think that he did that encouraged the game and encouraged it to grow 
uh, and allowed us to have courses as beautiful as this one here at Timber Ridge. And how many golf courses do you think he's got nationwide? I think his total, uh, if everything was counted, would be well over 700. I've been able to document 500 that I uh, have got some evidence, physical evidence, that he was there. Uh, I know that when some of the last publications that he uh, wrote in, uh, he had identified 800 courses. But uh, I, somewhere seven to 800, I think, was the, was the exact count that he did. Now, there's a, a whisper in the industry that, that some pirating goes on. With, with golf architects. Uh, do you think that some of the golf courses that he designed were kind of victims of, <laughs> of architecture pirating? Well, I think he was there at a lot of courses. I think he was there probably to do the initial layout. Uh, and as the courses uh, began to either mature or they got, uh, became more popular and people played them more, or the country clubs got more money, uh, they came in, redesigns were made. Uh, made by maybe more recognized people, and uh, then they became the architect of the course. It's interesting because as we go more into the story, he's definitely uh, a, a, had a huge impact on golf in the United States, and yet the golfing public really isn't aware of him and, and the things that he's done in the industry. What do you think has prevented that from happening? That's a very good question, Bart, because I have, I have asked that of a number of golf writers. Uh, I've written letters to people and asked them why, uh, what happened? Because in the 20s, uh, he was known as the Dean of American Golf Architecture. He was recognized all over as an expert in golf architecture and the game. And then all of a sudden, uh, after he died, uh, he seemed to disappear. And I'm not sure exactly why that was. Uh-huh.